We are live. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tanana Reeve Dew. I am the Cosby Chair in the Humanities at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. This is our first Google Hangout as a part of the Octavia Butler Celebration of Arts, Arts and Activism, which actually kicks off next week. But this is just a little taste of what's to come. I'm joined by wonderful panelists who uh, will join me in a talk about what drew us to speculative fiction, Octavia's work, why we do what we do, how we do what we do. And just to tell you a little bit about myself, I, I teach creative writing and screenwriting at Spelman. I published probably a dozen novels, uh, including My Soul to Keep, The Good House. Those are some titles people know. I also co-authored the Tennyson Hardwick Mystery Series with my husband and collaborator and co-panelist, Stephen Barnes, who is here with us today, uh, in partnership with the actor Blair Underwood. And uh, very recently, I won a Lifetime Achievement Award in the Arts from the uh, Black Caucus, uh, Congressional Black Caucus. So that was, that was a huge surprise for me. In any case, as the Cosby Chair, I have done my best to highlight the work of the late Octavia E. Butler Steve knew her quite well. I had the privilege of meeting her several times. Not the long friendship Steve had, but, but certainly would have liked to consider her a friend. And last year, in 2013, we had the Octavia Butler Celebration of Arts and Activism, bringing together her friends, colleagues, editors, first teacher, and Samuel Delaney. That was a terrific time. This year, we've shifted the focus to arts and activism. Uh, and two of our panelists will be at this year's celebration, Adrienne Marie Brown, and John Jennings, but we're just giving you a taste of everyone. There is a black speculative fiction community, not just writers, but also, as you'll see in John Jennings, artists. And we wanted to talk to you about how you can approach your art in speculative fiction or in graphic novels or comics or whatever your geek passion is. I'm going to very briefly introduce the panelists and then we can go alphabetically, people, after I've introduced everyone, and I'll introduce everyone at the top. Then you can tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you got into the field and what your best advice is for young artists who want to follow in the footsteps of Octavia Butler and create fantastic arts. Our first panelist is Stephen Barnes. He's a New York Times bestseller. He's written more than 25 science fiction, fantasy, and horror novels. If you watch The Outer Limits on Showtime, his Stitch in Time episode starring Amanda Plummer won her an Emmy and it's one of the most popular in that show's run. They came back to it when they closed out the series. They came back to Steve's concept. He's won an NAACP Image Award. Uh, he's written for The New Twilight Zone, Stargate, Andromeda, Ben 10. He's been nominated for the Hugo, Nebula, Cable Ace Awards. Really, I'm not just saying this because I'm married to him. He's a genuine science fiction pioneer. <laughs> And uh, he's also my co-author on several novels, including those tennis and hardwood novels. And we just did a YA zombie series, Devil's Wake and Domino Falls, where we co-produced a short film, Danger Word, out of that. Our next panelist is Adrienne Marie Brown. She's a 2013 Kresge Literary Arts Fellow, writing science fiction in Detroit. Also received a 2013 Detroit Night Arts Challenge Award to run a series of Octavia Butler-based science fiction writing workshops. She's the co-editor of the forthcoming anthology, I'm very excited about this, called Octavia's Brood, Science Fiction from Social Justice Movements with Walida and Marisha, that's coming out in June. And learning from her 15 years of movement facilitation and participation, she approaches Octavia's work through the lens of emergent strategy. Strategies rooted in relationship, adaptability, embracing change. She's also helped to launch a network of Octavia Butler and Emergent Strategy reading groups for people interested in her work. So that's Adrienne Marie Brown. Sheree R. Thomas. She's also credited as Sheree Renee Thomas. She's a writer, book editor, publisher. Most recently, she was the creative consultant on the upcoming anthology Octavia Group with Adrienne, social science fiction from social justice movement, and most known as the editor of the Dark Matter, groundbreaking Dark Matter anthology from 2000, where she collected works by some of the best African American writers in the genres of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Octavia was a part of that. Samuel R. Delaney, Charles Saunders, Steve, Juan Gomez, Mary, 
you named them they were in Dark Matter. So we're very pleased to have also Suri Don Jennings. He's an associate professor of visual studies at the State University of New York at Buffalo. His research and teaching focus on analysis, explication, and disruption of African American stereotypes in popular visual media. His research is concerned with the topics of representation and authenticity, visual culture, visual literacy, social justice, and design pedagogy. He's an accomplished designer, curator, illustrator, cartoonist, just recently working on the graphic novel adaptation of Octavia Butler's Kindred, which will be out, I believe, next year. So, right. Don, very excited to have all of you here. And I would just like to go to the top of the panel, under B for Barnes, and let you take it away, Steve. Okay, what, uh, what would be the best entry into this subject? Uh, you know you know me pretty well. What would you like me to speak on? Well, let's talk first about what brought you to science fiction, because when you started writing science fiction, there were not a whole lot of folks of color doing that. Maybe no. the lady that I can think of. Actually, when I started writing science fiction, I didn't know of any. I mean, because even though Chip Delaney and Octavia were writing some, I mean, uh, Chip had been doing it for some time, um, they certainly did not illustrate his books with black people. So how would I know? I mean, right. you can walk into a science fiction bookstore and see thousands of books, and my standard comment is that 99.9% .9 of all science fiction was white people and their imaginary friends. Um, you know, so you'd have white people, and you'd have aliens, and you'd have robots, and that's it. Uh, so I didn't know about anybody. So I watched science fiction just because my mind went in that direction. I just used to love stories of space and adventure stories and so forth. Um, and I think that I probably started writing partially with the same motivations anybody else does, just to express myself or try to do some of this neat stuff. But there was also the sense of wanting to fill in a gap, feeling like I was not represented. In, in these images, um, especially in like heroic fantasy, in which uh, when you know, black people were, were often shown, but it was they were very primitive and it was very derogatory. They were cannibals. They lusted after white women and boiled them alive and all sorts of terrible things. In the science fiction field, we simply didn't exist. Um, we there simply black people just did not exist in science fiction. Africa never got off its knees. No matter how far you got in the future, you never saw a consumer product made in Africa, you know, in any science fiction work. Uh, and we often died sacrificially. So I think that I probably did it because that was the most natural expression of my creativity and my imagination. But it was certainly was not a welcoming environment. Tell us, tell us what you think the most important craft lessons are. You, as someone who's been in the field a long time, I have heard you make comments about some of the things you think young writers aren't doing. What do you think should be in the toolbox of any writer who wants to write science fiction specifically? Well, they, they need two different things. First, they have to have a, a strong sense of themselves as a writer, per se. And in other words, they need to be very familiar with the best literature in the field that, that, they, can, that they can handle emotionally uh, and intellectually, and they need to have some, a grasp of the sciences. Um, you know what is the science that they're that they're familiar with? Are they really familiar with the scientific method and and what the the Western approach to understanding the universe has been? If you're going to be talking about science fiction, speculative fiction includes fantasy, you know. And so uh, the difference between science fiction and fantasy is like, all fiction is fantasy. Fantasy, right. but but the thing we call fantasy, which you know magic and so forth and so on, has to be internally consistent. But science fiction has to be externally consistent in terms of conforming to the rules of the, the phenomenological rules of the universe as we understand it, the laws of physics and biology and so forth. So I strongly suggest those two things, understanding both literature and the sciences, and then being able to then take a look at the classics in the science fiction field and understand how those two threads came together to create the great work. Um, I think that if you have that, uh, you've got to quite a bit. You, 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 you've got a lot of what it is that you need. I mean, there are specific rules about literature and the hero's journey and plotting and pacing and characterization that are pretty much constant across all fields of literature, but then you have specialized things within science fiction 
that have to do with asking the, the as if, you know, what if this happens, what if, if only, and if this goes on, as the, as the core questions of that field. And I see an awful lot of, of writers who are not familiar with this basic stuff that has supported the field for, you know, 100 years now. Uh, and, they're, and they end up in the position of trying to reinvent the wheel. And they're wasting a lot of their, their emotional energy and their intellectual juice trying to do that as opposed to actually being familiar with what the building blocks are. That's great. That's the danger of muting yourself. Well, thank you for that overview. What we're going to do, for those of you who have joined us, is we're going to have our panelists give sort of overview statements. You've just heard from Stephen Barnes. I'd like to move next to Adrian Marie Brown, who is of the new generation uh, of science fiction fantasy writers and also doing a great deal of work with Octavia Butler and her legacy. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Adrian. Um, hi, so I am a facilitator. I spent most of my time in my life working in social justice, um, doing facilitation, leading organizations, organizing different folks and communities, um, doing a lot of conflict resolution and visioning work. And all along that, I was reading Octavia Butler's work and other science fiction and finding that I was really strategically influenced by what I was reading but then it felt like there was no way to bring that into the social justice field or what I was doing there without you know, being completely dismissed. Um, and then in 2009, I started to sort of come out as a real sci-fi head and talk openly about the fact that Octavia Butler's work felt like case studies for me of strategies that we could actually try in our work. And she wasn't the only one. And I found that there were actually tons and tons of other organizers and activists and social justice thinkers who felt similarly and were excited to engage in the conversation. Um, and then agreed that science fiction and, and speculative fiction actually gave us so much space in which to try things out that we might not try out in an official strategy conversation at our nonprofit um, location. So um, I met an organizer named Walida Imarisha. And we were both budding sci-fi writers, and we decided, why don't we try this out? Why don't we publish an anthology of original science and speculative fiction from people who do social justice work with the idea that in the social justice realm, we need more vision. Um, we tend to sort of get stuck in the same loops of, like, if everyone had a garden, you know, but, like, how do we actually push through the real racial and economic conditions um, but also have the challenge of, you know, social justice Make, can make for some boring reading sometimes. Um, so how to actually really write things that are excellent uh, stories that really engage people and create a compelling future. And that's the idea is like how do we write ourselves into the future? How do we create a, a future that is neither utopian nor dystopian but compelling, a place we want to be? Um, new problems that are interesting to us. Um, Cherie Thomas actually was our advisor on the project and has read it over um, you've gotten to read some of it, Tanana Reeves, so it's, we feel really excited. John is going to be designing the cover, so this is kind of the family affair call right now. Um, and outside of that, I've just been doing, and I'm sure Steven's going to also love it, um, but outside of that, I've just been doing a bunch of facilitating now of community and collective writing workshops um, and getting people to go through and talk about building a world together and then all writing their own pieces within that world um, sort of like Walter Mosley's Future Land, but doing that on a small scale with lots of different communities. Mm -hmm. And then doing emergent strategy work. So the practices we see in Octavia's work and other people's work remind us of the science practices of emergence. And maybe further in the call we can talk about that. But how do we actually develop social leaders who are adaptive, who are relational, who think in terms of the fractal, um, you know, how do we do things at a small scale to get what we want at a large scale versus, you know, why doesn't Obama stop dropping drones? It's like, well, how do we handle conflicts in our community? Um, you know, how do you actually, st where do you start a conversation about change? So that's some of the stuff we've been doing. That's awesome. That's awesome. And very inspirational. You know, like I, I was uh, mentioning to the group earlier, watching your work was part of what helped me craft my theme for the Octavia Butler celebration this year. Yay. Last year it was more specific about the thing, I mean it was just about, more general rather, about the fantastic arts. This year I narrowed it to sort of an activism theme 
I'm the child of civil rights activists, so that really appeals to me. Mm -hmm. And also that question of how you walk in the world, both as an artist and as someone who wants to get your hands dirty a little bit mm -hmm. in the world. And that can take so many different forms. It can be your relationship with your child, your relationship mm -hmm. with your nieces and nephews, because the civil rights generation learned it begins at home. Right. But also protests, petitions, workshops, the whole gamut. And for those of you who are just joining us, I'm Tanana Revdu, the Cosby Chair at Spelman College. This is a virtual workshop. It's not just a writing workshop. We also have a, a graphic artist here. But we all work in the realm of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Love the work of Octavia Butler. And we wanted to give you some tips on how to create in the field and tell you a little bit about how we enter the field. So I will move next alphabetically to John Jennings, who is our only graphic artist on the panel. I'm skipping myself. I'll go last. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, that's not alphabetic. <laughs> Hilarious. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm an associate professor of visual studies here in uh, the BLO, uh, Buffalo, New York, at the University of Buffalo. Um, a lot of my work deals with uh, the, the black image in popular culture. Um, I'm a graphic novelist, I'm a curator, um, a writer. I do like a lot of analysis um, and, and, and theoretical um, kind of like uh, discourse about uh, stereotypes in, in popular media. Uh, I, I got started with, you know, I was attracted to uh, the field because of comics in particular. Uh, my mother was a literature uh, major at Alcorn State University. I'm originally from Mississippi. And so I grew up in um, a very rural agrarian space, and so raised primarily by my grandparents. And my grandmother was a, you know, was really, um, you know, love to tell like ghost stories and this kind of thing, right? So I was always surrounded by like, you know, these kind of like haunted spaces. Um, and I still think of the South as a haunted space, and that's actually part of some of the work that I do right now. But my mom was always into speculative fiction. She was a huge science fiction fantasy. Um, reader, which she just passed down to me, and I actually started reading like a lot of mythology. I started with mythology, with like I think a lot of a lot of kids do, and um, you know I was really attracted to like Norse mythology, Egyptian mythology, and when she brought me uh, Stanley and Jack Kirby's uh, uh, creation, the, the Mighty Thor, which is based off of the the Norse mythology, uh, the, the Norse god of thunder, I was pretty much hooked on comics. It was it was that in Spider Man, and so I was just off and running and started drawing, you know, and reading. I was always reading voraciously as, as a kid, and so I ended up uh, really being interested in being an artist and creating uh, cartoons and graphic novels uh, pretty early on. And then I kind of let it go for a little bit. I was in uh, grad school, and I said, like, "Okay, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get serious, and I'm just gonna become a graphic designer." And then so in some way ended up doing a lot of these uh, curatorial exercises. Uh, in 2000, in 2005, um, there was this uh, this. Uh, exhibition from UCLA called the Masters of American Comics. And it was um, 15 of the greatest comic book artists to live you know, um, in history. But it was very exclusive, right? And there were no women on the show. Uh, there was one minority uh, uh, creator, George Herman, who at the time was, he was probably passing for white, you know? He, he created crazy, crazy cat in the 1920s. And so and my friend Damien and I just thought that that was a very limiting view of such a powerful media. And so we started doing a lot of uh, curatorial exercises to kind of fill in the gaps. And so we created this show called Out of Sequence, Underrepresented Voices in American Comics. And so that look, it was um, 65 artists. Instead of 15 artists, we, we wanted like a bigger breadth of, you know, who was actually making uh, this, you know, comics in this particular um, in this fashion. And so we started with like 1927, all of the then current day um, uh, and, and this was at University of Illinois, and it was a huge success. We had about, I think, close to 800 people came to our opening. It was, it was and it, it was the main show at the time. And so that actually started us thinking about, you know, just spaces of agency in different media, right? And so that's why we ended up doing a lot of research on the Black Age of Comics, which is an underground, well, not, this independent comics movement that's been around since like the mid '90s, that um, artists of color have been creating comics through, right? And uh, just recently, I've been doing some, uh, some. Um, Organizing around, uh, you know, just for comics festivals, uh, I'm part of a team to put together uh, this um, Black Comic Book Festival at the Schomburg uh, Center in Harlem. And this past um, January, we had over over 2,000. It was 2,400 people came through, um, and it was pretty amazing. It was like artists of color and and, and, and 
audiences of color just to, to, to check out, you know, the wares that have been put together by these independent black artists. Um, yeah, so I'm, that, that's kind of like, that's, that's, that's some of the things I do. Um, as far as, like, craft, I'm thinking, if you're going to be doing graphic novels, I, I like using, uh, I'm, I'm a really big film buff, too. I'm uh, really interested in, in storytelling. I think we're made of stories in a certain sense. We always keep editing ourselves to a certain degree. And um, the filmic language, I think, translates very well into comics. And a lot of people always say, you know, you should, you should uh, write uh, and create what you know. And so I think um, fostering an infinite amount of curiosity. Uh, I'm very curious about a lot of things. And so I try to know a lot of, a lot of things about, about the people that I'm working. But research, I think, is a really big aspect, as Steve was saying earlier. Um, the other thing is is uh, is really trying to do something small at first, right? I think I think we're we, we're in the age of the epic. We're so used to reading and, and talking and epics that we forget that you know if you're going to do a novel, you should probably start with like you know something a little bit smaller first and kind of build build that uh that that, that kind of prototype and kind of start building. I think um, I think the same thing with comics. I mean, if you look at something like Batman, I think Batman started out as like a six page comic or something, and now it's a multi you know, that national uh, property, right? Um, yeah, okay. It, you want me to, you have any particular questions you want me to, to address besides the craft piece? Or? Well, no, no. We're, uh, we will wait. I think we, we're, we've stunned and awed our audience, so we're, we're going to wait for questions until okay. after we make our presentations. Okay. And if people are shy, then I'll generate some questions. But that's a great overview. So, so yeah, thank you, John. Sure. And last <laughs> Certainly not least, Cherie R., Cherie Renee Thomas, I have known you for years. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a long, long publication history, but I'm quite sure so many people do know you from the, the Dark Matter anthology, which, which you did when you were really a very new writer uh, yourself, mm -hmm. and just sort of through the boldness and the audacity to make it happen. So uh, I would love to know a little bit about that, if you don't mind speaking about that, but also about what drew you to the field. Mm -hmm. and, and some of your own thoughts off the top of your head about craft in general. Oh, okay, great. Um, I grew up in a family. I'm from the South. I'm from Memphis. That's where I am right now. And I had parents who um, were just really avid uh, science fiction lovers. I grew up reading science fiction um, from a very small age. Both my parents had it. They had those, uh, those 80s uh, beds that had the bookshelves in the back. <laughs> it was filled with books, and science fiction was a part of it. Um, so I read that. Also, I read um, Black Arts Movement. I read uh, works that had Don Lee on there before he became, you know, Hockey Body uh, Booty and Sonia Sanchez and other works. So it just came up in a house of readers. Um, fast forward to I was taking a, a slavery and literature class in college, and our professor had assigned a really interesting um, a list of works. We read uh, Jubilee, Margaret Walker's Jubilee. We read um, uh, Kindred. And um, I think it's the combination between those two books, <laughs> mm -hmm. Jubilee and the Kindred um, novel, just kind of, it really left a mark on me. I would say it kind of um, sparked a fire that I hadn't had since I was really young, because I actually stopped reading in the genre at a really young age. Um, fast forward, I knew I wanted to have something to do with writing. I knew I wanted to be with people who love words. Mm -hmm. And so um, my heart was telling me to go to New York, the heart of publishing. So I immediately um, moved to New York, and um, I worked two jobs. I was a, a first a freelance, uh, uh, not freelance, a editorial floater, which was a program that Random House had at the time that allowed you to to experience all the different parts of publishing. You got to see the public publicity department. You got to work in editorial. You got to work in audio. You got to work in um, where the people were writing the jacket copy and everything um, in production. It was really exciting, and then you chose the area you wanted to be in. I knew already I wanted to be in editorial, so that's where I started um, my training. It's uh, an apprenticeship uh, position when you're working in uh, publishing, and I was very fortunate to work with two wonderful um, women editors, uh, Cheryl Woodruff, um, mm -hmm. who was over one world books, Valentine books at the time, and also Carolyn Nich Nich Nichols, who was doing women's uh, fiction and romance um, and kind of moved on from there. And I also worked, um, my side hustle was working at Forbidden Planet, which was a science fiction bookstore across from the Strand. So <laughs> it's like the best <laughs> of both worlds, <laughs> you know. So, um, and I just happened to, like, people might have heard the story of how I did Dark Matter, but um, I basically um, all used Stephen Barnes, Tana uh, do you finish your books? 
and I had them already on my shelf. Um, actually, Cheryl Woodruff was the one who gave you your first book, um, Tana and the Reef. Um, oh, wow. So she actually walked it over to me and said, she really liked the scary stuff. And I was in a Barnes & Noble, and I was looking for more. I read LeVar Burton's book. I just wanted I Octavia Butler's. I just wanted something else, and the associate um, couldn't find any more black science fiction for me, and he sent me to um, a Martin Greenberg anthology of Japanese science fiction that had been translated. Mm -hmm. And I went home with that book, but I was really kind of disappointed. And it, like in the middle of the night, it just came to me that, I really wanted to create the book that I wanted to read, and there was no reason on earth that book shouldn't have already existed. We should have had, you know, you know, several volumes of of, of speculative fiction, black science fiction, fantasy by writers of color, um, particularly black writers. And so that's kind of planted the seeds for me. So um, it's been a long journey <laughs> um, in terms of like being in that classroom, or being that that daughter, that child, that little, little person that you were punished by. Sending her to her room to read, um, uh, not uh, we're actually sending, making her get out of her room and go outside. <laughs> I actually preferred to be in my room reading and um, kind of being in this area where you're doing collaborative uh, work, where you're reaching out to these writers, some that you know and admire, and really respect others that you you've never met but you really love their work, and having them trust you with um, their 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 art and having them trust that you'll put it together in a way that um, honors them and honors um, what you're trying to do in the field. So I, I felt really uh, very blessed and humbled. Um, how it all came together was really amazing. So, yeah. Well, we, we all have dark matter on our shelves, and all <laughs> of you listening need to get dark matter on your shelves right away. It really is such a definitive anthology. I didn't even know W.E.B. Du Bois had written a science fiction story. I know, I know, I know. Um, <laughs> and I have to thank Charles Saunders for um, that conversation. Um, so many people, um, Mike Sargent, who helped me find Charles Saunders. <laughs> who people thought when he was, they thought he had died, and he was, he was just in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and he's on Facebook now. Yeah, so. he's on Facebook now. <laughs> I thank you for introducing me to uh, Henry Dumas's work. Oh yeah. On the phones, I was like, oh. That, that, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's just his stuff. I actually own everything he had that he wrote down. Seriously, yeah. uh, because yeah. of Dark Matter. So. Amazing writer, and there is actually a new uh, biography of his of his life out right now. Oh, really? I see. Yeah, um, I, I learned about that on the Kavi Khanna list. That um, that's out. So look for that. Yeah. I, I would like to acknowledge the presence of my Spelman College class that I'm co-teaching with Dr. Tarsha Stanley. Uh, she's taking the lion's share since I'm actually in LA right this moment and <laughs> she's in Atlanta with the class. But we've been teaching this term a class called uh, Butler's Daughters, Imagining Leadership in Black Speculative Fiction. Also again in the run up to the celebration that, that happens next week. But to, to help these young people get exposure to um, Octavia's work. We read Dawn and Parable of the Sower and Fledgling and also Virginia Hamilton, Justice and Her Brothers. Yes. My novel, My Soul to Take, which is an arc of an 18 year old who has to walk into her power, and Nettie Akorafors, Who Fears Death, she will be there next week at Spelman. I mentioned these works specifically because when it comes to writing, there is no better training than reading. I think as, as a panel we would all be agreed on this. You have to read, read voraciously. If it's not coming naturally to you, then force it. <laughs> and I'm talking to myself again because now I find myself reading for research and reading for blurbs and, and not reading with that hunger that I had as a, as a learning writer who just, I, I looked at books as if they held this great secret, like what is this great secret I can find in this book? And that's the kind of reader you really need to be. Uh, I, I tell, I hear all the time from new writers that they're afraid, they don't want to read maybe some Octavia or some black science fiction or fantasy or horror because they don't want to be influenced by those writers. And my answer to that is we should be so lucky as to be influenced by those writers. This is how we learn as writers is from reading. So if you're avoiding the kind of fiction that you aspire to write, it's often a big mistake. Uh, although Steve often says, I shouldn't put words in his mouth, read also works that um, Which you don't like. Quantify, but at a level higher than what you want to write. Uh, I read the classics, read literature, read worldwide literature. Uh, don't just limit your canon to what you learned in, in high school because it, there are those nutrients to being a, a wonderful writer 
in that in that wonderful reading. And the and the other thing, apologies to my class who just had this lecture, but I really do approach story through character. And if there's one thing I find with learning writers uh, who specifically want to write science fiction, fantasy, and horror, mm -hmm. it's that the premise comes to us first very often. It's like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if there was a mushroom that if you took this mushroom in combination with the flu shot, it turned you into a zombie. That's part of the premise of the novel uh, Devil's Wake that, that Steve and I wrote together. It has sort of a scientific underpinning. We decided at least to make an effort to explain why it was happening, which most zombie <laughs> stories do not. It just sort of appears. But um, so we had a scientific, sort of a scientific underpinning. But that's not a story. That's a premise, you know. Uh, yeah, that would be really interesting if the combination of a mushroom that people take for weight loss and a flu shot, and again, drawing from headlines because people do take flu shots. The more you can draw your fiction, especially your near future fiction, from what's actually happening. It has a lot of resonance with your readers. But beyond just that premise, you find your story through the character. And a story is not just a bunch of stuff that happens. Uh, I, I would define it as a character's interaction with the events. You know, it's this happens and the character reacts this way. And it's the character's reactions that really dictate what the story is. So find that person for whom your premise is like the very worst thing that could ever happen to them. Our protagonist is a 16-year-old girl named Kendra, mm -hmm. and when her parents turn into zombies, that's pretty bad. That's a bad situation for her. <laughs> so, so it's how she reacts to the situation, how she reacts to being suddenly orphaned, how she reacts when her grandfather has to care for her, and here's some, uh, someone she's barely known, and now he is her, her sole life support because he's teaching her survival skills, which, which we talked about in our film Danger Word. Um, so I would say look at character. That was what really appealed to me when I look back at those writers when I was learning who had a really deep influence on me. Uh, it was t Toni Morrison. I read the classics. I read, I read Gloria Naylor. Mama Day blew my mind because she was like, aha, she's doing this. She's doing this fantasy premise in a way that's very accessible because um, it wasn't just sort of drawn from that rural experience that, that Alice Walker say drew from. Uh, because I hadn't really had that, and I had not had an urban, per se, experience. I grew up in the suburbs. You can't help where you grew up. I grew up in air conditioning. We didn't have so much as a tomato patch in our backyard, so I didn't know anything about rural living. <laughs> but, um, yes, find those characters to walk through your premise and make it real. That's the thing. If you can convince your readers that these are real, breathing, living people, they will follow you through 400 pages of pure how, because they believe those people are real. Yeah. Anyone else you may jump in if you have thoughts about, about character. Please, by the way, if you're viewing, tweet us your questions, hashtag Octavia Butler Spellman, and we would love to answer your questions, but in the meantime, we will talk amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did anyone well, else I'll jump in? in? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say... Tanana Reeve has been working with me as my writing coach for the past few months, which has been um, really amazing, but has also deeply shifted how we have been doing our writing workshops with folks because of this piece around focusing on character. And it's actually vastly changed the kind of collective writing that comes out. Because a lot of times people have a collective writing experience and they start talking about, again, these, these premises. Well, what if you know, these drone characters and the drones get hacked and then the AI is, you know, like go down that path and it's like, well, who are the human beings? As organizers and activists, we want to center our work always around who are the human beings that's, that are trying to change the world and how do we fall in love with them? Um, right. And falling in love with them is what's going to make us want to follow them, right? So that's one of the things we know from good organizing is like when you feel you trust someone, you care about them, you love them, then that's when you want to follow them and how to do that outside of the charismatic leader narrative, right? How to actually do that in a way that's like, I care about you and you care about me because I'm being honest and open and transparent. And so we start to try to bring those kind of characters in. Who are the kind of characters that people would want to follow? And right. again, at Octavia's work, it's like, why did people want to follow this 15-year-old to 18-year-old young woman, Lauren Olamina? You know, like, why did they say, oh, you've got a religion and I'll believe you and I'll trust you? Like, what was it about her character? And, and then challenging people, like, how can we create compelling characters as our leaders um, and folks who know how to work in collective or collaborative ways? 
so that we're not just recreating her hero narratives for, with a social justice twist, mm -hmm. um, but actually creating a new way of uh, understanding change in community. So yeah, I think that character piece is crucial. And, and then it helps, again, with, I keep saying this, but writing ourselves into the future, it's like, who are we in that time period? Like, don't try to come up with, you know, uh, last night, the group that I was working with, we were writing about Detroit in 2045. Mm -hmm. It was like, we're not talking about, like, super bot characters that are totally different from ourselves. It's just going to be us in 20-plus years. So, you know, what would we be doing at that time, and who would we care about, and how is this going to, you know, how are we going to behave in a Detroit at that time? It's not going to be something totally different from now, and that helps. You know, people are like, you build character from understanding yourself as deeply as you can. It's really that exploration. Right. <laughs> Can I make a comment, T? Oh, yeah. Okay. When I wrote uh, an alternate history novel, um, Lion's Blood, in which Africa developed a technological civilization prior to Europe, it was set in the past, but I knew I had to have some very specific ideas about how history had evolved. What, in other words, there are two basic questions you have, you know, who am I and what is true? You know, what is what is the human being and what is the world that the human being experiences? Um, if you're talking about the future, your understanding of the future, your ability to extrapolate into the future is going to be based on your understanding of what is now and your your theories about why are we what we are now, how did we get to where we are now. In other words, you follow those trends for thousands of years, you get to 2014, it's not that difficult to extrapolate those trends into the future. But I think that it, it behooves any writer, I mean, if art, from my definition, is self-expression, then it and self with a with a capital S. Then it behooves any writer or any artist to be in touch with themselves, to to be exploring themselves, to have something to say about who they are, what humanity is, what the world is. Science fiction is nothing other, like I said, than an extrapolation of that, or going sideways, asking, well, what if our technology was different? Or and fantasy is generally taking a series of cultural or emotional tropes, images you know, uh, Jungian archetypes and exploding them and taking a look at, they're, they're usually about the emotions of the people rather right. than an extrapolation of a scientific idea. Um, right. But all of this, at the core of all of this are these twin things. What is the world and what are the human beings, what are the human beings that explore and express that world and shape that world and change that world. So every writer has an obligation to develop a, a philosophy about what we are, how did we, how do we get to where we are in the world? In that same philosophy, will then take them into what is next, and they should be prepared to defend that philosophy at length in what they write, because every story is in essence an argumentation. You're saying this is the way human beings are, and or this is the way the world is. So that sense of experiencing the world, having an idea about where human beings are in the universe. If you're specifically dealing with black issues, you're going to have questions about, well, how did black people get to where we are right now? Why did slavery happen the way it did? What is happening in terms of uh, genetic intermixing in the United States? And will there be black people in the future? Or will everybody just be sort of you know, brownish? You know, what right. is going on in those senses? And be prepared to defend your statement. To me, that conversation is a, a critical one for artists in any field, but especially in science fiction and especially for black people who are attempting to fill in cultural gaps where we do not exist in the narrative. If you're going to take that responsibility, then you know, step up and really have something to say. I was thinking, um, I was trying to answer this question too, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, we got a question. No, yeah, we got yeah, a couple yeah. of questions. No, yeah, yeah, I was, um, <clears throat> as far as like creating characters, you know, um, if you're doing a graphic narrative, you also have the added uh, uh, task of, of of designing physically the character as well, you know. And um, we do that through like a lot of uh, trial and error. So it's almost like being a casting director to a certain degree. You design and, and you have to do it again a lot of research as far as like the world building aspects of things. I find myself really att attracted to characters that um, that kind of go against that that kind of uh, the archetype. Again, that, that Steve was talking about, like for instance, a character like Hellboy, for instance, that is, is kind of like grotesque and, and, and usually scary. I mean, he's the devil, but yeah, he, but he's also the protagonist, you know. Or I find myself attracted to, to that type of uh, 
that type of narrative, or a character like the goon, or these kind of like, um, you know, these really odd characters that kind of push against what we think good is supposed to be, or, 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 or to kind of like um, flip some of these some of these physical attributes that, that usually are associated. I, lo- I love like you know pretty villains, for instance, you know, because it totally goes against what a villain is supposed to uh, supposed to look like. That's one of the things that I guess attracts me to to Game of Thrones, for instance, you know, the, the, the Jamie. The, the, the Jamie, uh, 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 what's his name? His last. I just started watching it. You know the, that particular character. So this idea of like pushing against um, stereotypes is something that really interests me a lot. So I find myself doing like a lot of Lannister, Jamie Lannister. Okay, that's it. Um, yeah. So so I find myself doing like a lot of uh, uh, character sketches, like a lot, and, and um, to the point where I have to draw the character from pretty much every standpoint. You know, and that becomes part of the physical language. So you have to know a lot about like physical pantomime and you know, learning how to 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 create a characteristic in someone by just uh, just drawing it. You know, uh, and and not and so it's nonverbal communication. So, and also uh, you know different aspects of their fashion. I mean, these 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 are part of the world building things that we do when we do like a graphic piece. As far as like the the, the Kindred book, I mean, I had to do like a lot of research on um, you know that particular time piece, like looking at uh, the Regency era, which is very different than you know the uh, the Annabellum era, right? Because this this takes place in the Regency era, so the fashion is a bit different. A uh, little small things, for instance, like like the the men during the era didn't wear, they didn't have mustaches and stuff, right? Because they're all clean shaven, because that was the style, that kind of thing. And uh, and, and even like you know, just notches on, you know, on on the on the uh, coats and things. I mean, it's these really particular pieces that you know people into uh, historical fiction are going to be looking for. You know, so this is, and also the architecture. Oh my God, the descriptions of, of architecture, and it's that becomes like the character itself of graphic narrative. So that's the way. That's what I'm looking at as well. So you know how the characters interacting with each other, but also the physical manifestation of that character. Okay, that's great. I'm looking at our questions. We have some great questions <laughs> from our our listeners uh, coming to us via Twitter. So, and some of them are, are difficult to answer, I must say. Uh, some questions about writing in the future, some questions about whether we've seen more of a trend toward psychologically driven black science fiction, fiction as opposed to event driven. I right. guess to answer that, that uh, latter question first, I think perhaps black science fiction is so new, it's really hard for me to think of black science fiction that was ever sort of rooted more in events than characters. Some of you may be able to correct me, but the science fiction I'm thinking of has always is very character driven. Yeah. Is that a, a component of our of our approach? Uh, I don't know. Right. I, I I think I'd have to agree because a lot of it is about you, you. We were talking before we started about the dearth of images and the dearth of stories. You know that were in the that. That are in the um, the industry. I mean, you even. I mean, I've even seen like um, Octavia Butler talk about, you know, loving the particular, uh, loving speculative fiction and having to write herself, like you said, into that space. And so, um, that's a very like conflict-driven and psychological aspect. There. I mean, it's um, you know, it's really, it's really, it's really a type of resistance to erasure. And you know, and I think that that conflict in itself is, um, you know, is a psychological aspect. Of, well, wow, so. I I just like to add to what Tananari said. I um, I don't think we have co- arrived at the critical mass yet <laughs> to make um those kinds of generalizations. I guess maybe you could take maybe a few writers, like if I took um you know the ones who are here tonight or a part of this conference um that's coming up, um and just take a handful of their stories because we keep in mind a writer. Um, this is what I found with Dark Matter. Um, both the the volumes. Because if I took um, stories from Tanana Reef 2, she could, she could give me three or four different kinds of stories. They're not going to be necessarily the same. I might get a werewolf story from Tanana Reef. I might get a story about uh, a, a child in a, 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 in a very difficult situation, um, a, a cloning story. I might get um, uh, someone who's in a uh, nursing home uh, facility and strange things are happening. I mean, there, um, uh, I might get a zombie apocalypse. I mean, you never know. Um, even if you just take these few writers. So to make those kinds of generalizations, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, there's still only a very few writers who are part of the canon. Um, of course, Octavia Butler, thank goodness we're celebrating her. 
um, Sam Delaney, of course, the uh, you know Tanana Reeve and Stephen Barnes, but there are many others who are starting to slowly begin to get studied as well from academics. And I think as um, more of the the work is out there and being published and being read, not just as a black science fiction phenomenon, but in other contexts as part of American literature or part of a world literature. Um, um, we, we may be able to draw more conclusions, but I don't think, as long as I can still use my two hands or, you know, or borrow one other hand and come up with uh, veins, we have a lot, a lot more uh, writing to do, a lot more publishing to do, I think, in those terms. Yeah. In terms of building critical mass, we also had a question from Twitter. When you are compiling an anthology, what generally is the difference between a story that makes the cut and a story it doesn't? What um, where it pop and really stand out? Um, I tried to answer that really quickly on the Twitter. Um, um, for me, it's the stories that stands out. I mean, I know people think it's the name of the person, it's their their whole uh, you know publishing history or what have you. That's not necessarily the case. It's the it's the kind of story that the that sticks with you. It's a story that yet you know, when you leave your desk or wherever you're reading, if you're on the train and you keep thinking about it, you keep thinking about that character. Um, the way you you know the build the story, make it strong. Do I care about this character? Am I curious? Am I worried for this character? Um, does it, this writer have something different to say about um, the human experience or whatever is going on? Have they drawn my attention to an area of life or or a way of thinking that I I would never necessarily come across on my own? Um, those are the kinds of things that make me put you know a story in, in this pile versus another pile. Um, do I want to sit down and read it for pleasure or Am I reading it because I have to? Um, so it's a, I mean it's a subjective thing. I don't think it's a, a an exact science, but um, the ones that um, I ended up working with were the stories that um, they just stuck with me. They challenged me, or they moved me. They made me think and feel something. It wasn't just pretty words on the page, um, or it wasn't just action or what have you, or it wasn't just you know interesting uh, concepts and abstractions. It was the combination of all that and how it made me feel afterwards, you know. So. Does anyone else want to jump in on that question about what really makes work stand out? I would, I, yeah, I would say a word on that. I mean, for Octavia's Brood, one of the things we were really aware of is, was this challenging the narrative the way we normally hear this? Um, and there were a lot of ways that that could happen. Um, you know, we looked at, like, did this offer some different vision for how conflict got resolved in a community. Did it offer a different narrative in terms of who was telling the story? And not just like, we need a black person and that's different, you know, but really looking at gender, really looking at ability, really looking at who are the voices that we still don't really hear, the kind of couples that we don't get to hear love stories of. Um, like, and, and, uh, and then what is the challenge? How many of these stories can be very collaborative or collective in terms of the solutions that they offer? Um, and then there was a lot of stuff where I was like, is this um, titillating? You know, I think of Audre Lorde talks about the, the uses of the erotic, and I think about that a lot when I'm reading stories about, like, what actually kind of turns me on on a lot of different levels? You know, not just like, oh, this is sexy, but, but like, is this... Um, there's something that sort of happens when you're reading a story that you can't put down. You, and I feel like that. That's why I held up this story earlier because I'm reading The Good House right now by Tanana Do, and I can't put it down. It keeps giving me sensations. You know, it's really scaring me and really <laughs> interesting to me. And the narrative feels very different from what I normally get to experience. I feel like, um, you know, I'm not scared in the normal ways, and I care about different people in different ways. And Everyone needs to read The Good House is part of the plug. But also, um, just really feeling like, yeah, as I was going through and, and Walida and I were selecting stuff for Octavia's Brood, it was like, are we moved um, first and foremost? And then are we excited um, by what we're reading? And then can we kind of imagine ourselves wanting to be inside of the story? That ultimately is the, the story that we, the stories that we return to and the ones that are going to be published. Great. Thank you for that great plug and that great response. Uh, one thing I'll say in terms of what works and doesn't work, not so much as an editor, but for me as an instructor, mm -hmm. I tend to notice more with my speculative fiction students that their works are derivative of television and movies. 
more right. often, I would say, than in just sort of general fiction, because that's what excited you. You know, you saw a zombie movie, you saw a vampire movie, you saw a space movie. Right. So we're applying sort of that that um, cinematic language and images and to the story, and that's fine. I I wrote a zombie novel. I'm one to talk, but we never actually used the word zombie in our story. We sort of started from zero, like, okay, what would people call these creatures <laughs> who started biting you all of a sudden? Um, and and pretend that the zombie movies don't exist and write it as if we own it. And that would be my advice, even if you're taking something familiar like vampires. Write it like you own it. Maybe you don't even call them vampires. You know, someone may, might say, oh, like a vampire. <laughs> but, but you have your own name for what these creatures are. They have their own history. Really, I think, work to find the originality even inside a well-worn premise. And we've had a lively sort of side chat among the participants about one of the questions, which came from one of my students, actually, Brianna, and now I'm probably going to, uh, to butcher it as I try to remember it. It was a long time ago. But she thought there was kind of a devaluation of writing, and she wondered what storytelling would look like, what writing will look like in the future. And we had a, a lively side conversation about this, chatting. What, what do you guys think about that? Is writing being devalued, and what does the future look like? Right. Okay, remember, it's never been about writing. It's always been about story. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always been about communicating emotion. Right. Um, and story, so storytelling can be dance. It can be art. Um, I'm not sure, you know, maybe there's some creatures that tell stories with exchanges of pheromones or something. Writing is really important because writing was the first, was one of the huge advantages human beings had in terms of passing information from one generation to the next. But it was never the point. It was never about the books. It was always about, let me sequence this, this series of emotional responses. Now, these words are going to help me do that. But so will these illustrations. So will the, this music. So will this dance. So as we're getting all these different um, art forms mashing up and, and made more available for people at, at the core, at, the, at the, the base level, you know, garage band on every Macintosh, you know, is, is more powerful than, than full studios, you know, were for music 30 years ago, by far. Um, there are things that you can do now that are just so powerful. So I don't think it's anything to be afraid of because all that we really wanted is to answer the question, who am I and what is true? And we provide people with horror or laughter or romance, but always references what is it to be human and what is the universe that human beings see and influence. So mm -hmm. these things, you know, these things are just a part of the puzzle. It's going to shift. It has always shifted. But as long as your intent is to take what is inside you and communicate people outside you, I don't see that there being any lasting issue. Yeah. I have to agree. You know, I, I think just to piggyback a little bit, that, um, look, you know, the book, the Codex has always been a type of technology, and that right now we're faced with all these different types of technologies that are kind of advancing how we disseminate information. And so, like you're saying, I mean, we we now can create multimodal experiences through all these different types of, you know, writing. And um, one of the things I love, and I'm, I'm going to stop talking because I see we have something else to address before we run out of time, is uh, dance, for instance. Uh, choreography literally means dance writing. And so, you know, I love this idea of the body being a vehicle of, of design and, and creating story. Right? And so I actually have co collaborated with dancers because as a graphic designer, I'm really fascinated by this notion of, you know, physical calligraphy, this kind of idea. And so uh, that's part of a project that I worked on once with, uh, with a mover. And so, yeah, I think what's happened is that some kind of way we've, we've kind of like separated these, tip these we compartmentalized these things into these different spaces. And um, even the notion of a department in a university, if you want to go to a, a very segregated space, go to a university, right? Because everybody's like, you know, studying these particular tracks and not really playing well together. And I think that sometimes um, that really kind of uh, segregates people and we forget these, these notions of, of, of how stories bring us together, right? And so, yeah, that's the narrative I think that we have to kind of push back against. Yeah, right. I think that this one, I just want to throw on there that um, I really do feel like storytelling has moved from a body art into this mind art for a period of time and I feel like it's moving back out of the mind into the body and into a lot of other spaces and I think technology gives us an interesting place to play um, mm -hmm. with mind, spirit, body and, and other things like being able to write collectively with a bunch of other people um, or 
you know, or organize with a bunch of other people in ways that are visionary. You know, we have been saying a lot that we think all organizing and all activism and all social justice is speculative fiction. It is science fiction. It's it's trying to imagine a world that doesn't exist and then build, use your body and mind and spirit and time and breath to bring it into being. And our ancestors did the same thing without having any reason to think that survival was even possible. They were envisioning us somehow and, and creating a world in which we would exist. And that continues to be um, the way that I understand storytelling is we are envisioning and creating and telling and then remembering and using that memory to envision the next thing. And it just becomes this loop. And I love that that loop now can happen on multiple levels, right. body, mind, spirit, and all those levels at the same time. That's thrilling to me. We, we're running very short of time. Really quickly, I wanted to address a question, a good question. How do we incorporate social justice without making it a sermon? I remember a quote, and I can't remember who said it, uh, about uh, art, when you add politics to art, it's akin to a gunshot in an opera house. You know, there's a thin line between art and propaganda. If someone can credit that quote, please help me with that. But um, how do you do it? I, I you know, subtly, uh, sometimes every artist has a different approach. Really quickly, to use an example from my work, I was writing uh, the novel Blood Colony about magical blood under the Bush administration. And for some time, I had watched the growing prison populations and the war on drugs and just seen some absurdity there and how drug policies were carried out. And I had researchers uh, tell me very specifically that if my blood did exist, it would be illegal. <laughs> and here's why. And I really wanted to create an underground railroad to distribute this magical healing blood right. as a metaphor to sort of show the idiocy of drug policies and our, our prison population, that these young people were being chased as terrorists and lies were being told about them as terrorists, as many lies were being told during that administration. Um, and that was my way of doing it, but well woven within the story. Right. You know, it's the, the what if, if only, and if this goes on. Whatever your social justice issue is, find a way to reverse it, mirror it, exaggerate it, act, ask what the world would be like if this were not true, then set a believable human being within that world and have something about the change that you have made or the extrapolation that you wish to, to deal with story. Because it, the, this, the plot, all plot is, is what a given character does in a given situation. So right. the way that the universe responds to his efforts shows you the ethical structure of that universe. What a person does in the situation creates another aspect of it. So it's it, look at how other people have done it really well and imitate the best work you can find. That's great. I would add on to that to keep it complex. You know, the, I, I love a great sermon, but the sermons I love the most are the ones that acknowledge the complexity of the human being and let go of the right and wrong black and white scenario. Right. And right. I think the same thing is very true in, in a story where it's like, it's not just like now everyone has food justice and no one ever eats Cheetos and that's the future. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm a food justice activist and I've eaten a Cheeto before and I'm still here and I'm thinking about Cheetos sometimes. You know, it's like <laughs> make it more complex, like show that the range of humanity is is whatever and um, whatever other world we're imagining we're still going to be these complex messy miraculous creatures and if we do that then it doesn't i don't think hit too hard over the head right i think you're talking about adding that humanity like maintaining the fact that we are imperfect beings i mean um octavia butler said that she thought that humans were ultimately um hierarchical and that was part of our our failing but it's yeah. it's the the imperfections that make characters interesting, right, and right. the the way that things, as you said, Adrian, things get messy, and you have a plan for you know a character, or a character thinks they're going to get from A to, to B, and and then the worst thing happens. As Tananda Reeves says, the very worst thing possible happens to them, and how right. do they you know rise to the occasion or not to, right. to to meet the challenge? That's what makes story interesting. That's you know what makes life. <laughs> so very interesting, um, the unplanned and the imperfections of it. One, one, I'm okay. sorry, you did let this last thing. I, I'm, I'm looking at the work in a medium that's inherently subversive. Comics are really subversive because for some reason, as soon as you start looking at a comic, it, it becomes surreal. And so you can deliver a lot of subtle metaphorical things by reifying them through that space. And then, as soon as you start reading a comic book or a graphic novel, your head goes into this really like dreamlike space where you can kind of like deal with that information. So. 
Great. This, this <laughs> panel, I could do this all night. This is amazing. I love this panel. We, we are at the hour mark. Before we close it out, I want to remind everyone that we are having the Octavia Butler Celebration of Arts and Activism at Spelman College next week, Wednesday. Major panel, Black Science Fiction Film Showcase. Uh, Nettie Akorfor will do a reading with me. Juno Diaz will be there. Adrian will be there. John will be there. Um, as well as Dream Hampton, Bree Newsom, a filmmaker. If you can't make it to Atlanta, it will be live streamed. So go to the Spelman College web website, spelman.edu, and, and look for the Activia Butler celebration. And also in closing, for those of you who are just learning about black speculative fiction, you want to know more, but this isn't quite enough, panel, do you have suggestions about where they can learn more? Um, I would recommend they go visit the Carl Brandon Society. Yes, thank the you. The Carl Brandon Society is a group of wonderful um, people who support like um, writers of color um, in the field, in the genre. Oh, and wow. they give out a thousand dollar award in the name of Octavia Butler to the best work of the year that explores race in it. And they also give out another thousand dollar award, the Parallax Award, to um, um, to a writer, uh, excuse me, I'm probably switching them up, but one is for a writer of color and another is for anyone who writes sci science fiction very well and explores race in a fascinating or interesting or, or novel way. And they're fundraising all year long. They help people get to conferences. They help people get um, research done. It's just a wonderful way to stay abreast of what's being published each year in short stories, in graphic novels. I think they've been uh, really looking at that as well, in uh, novels and, and just in all the in all the fields. So Carl Brandon Society is a good place to start. Carl Brandon, Carl is with a C. Carl with a C, yes, C A R L. Yeah, <laughs> he does have that great Octavia Butler scholarship, and Nisi Shaw, who could not be with us, has been administering that. Uh, panel, you're wonderful. Uh, thank you all so much. Everyone out there watching, please do explore the authors that you see up here, the artists you see up here. Look up Afrofuturism. There, there's actually a lengthy article on Wikipedia that has a lot of interesting information and elsewhere. But there is a growing worldwide community in Afrofuturism. It's, an, it's, a, it's a growing movement. We're just touching on the surface in an hour here. But thank you for joining us. This has been Spelman College. I'm Tanana Reeve the Cosby Chair in the Humanities. Thank you so much to all the panelists, John Jennings, Adrian Marie Brown, Cherie Renee Thomas, and my husband, Stephen Barnes. We will see you the next time. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>